Brianna Reed, and I go to school here at Philadelphia University. I'm a senior law society student, and I'm also the director of the Arlen Spectre Center. Tonight, we have a special host, Dr. Nash, coming from Tom Sharpson University, and we'll be talking about the health care issues that our new president-elect, Mr. Donald Trump, will be facing. And I'll turn it over to you. Well, good evening. Really fantastic to be here, and especially in a house that Thomas Jefferson apparently visited, so that's uh, extra special for me. And later I'll tell a great Senator Specter story that you couldn't make up if you tried. Uh, so, but it's really a pleasure for me to be here. So uh, I'm a primary care general internist. Uh, I've been at Jefferson on the faculty for 26 years. Uh, the last eight as the inaugural dean of the nation's first college devoted to improving the health of the population. Much more about that later, but really a thrill to be here. And I want to thank Dean Dreyer and Evan for inviting me and for being in this wonderful place and some of our students here as well. So more on that too. Really great to be a part of this. Hi, uh, I'm Mike Dreyer. I'm the Executive Dean of the College of Science, Health and Liberal Arts here at Philadelphia University. Hi, I'm Monique Chabot. I'm Assistant Professor of Occupational Therapy here at Philadelphia University. <coughs> Hi, um, I'm Pooja, I'm a first-year grad student for occupational therapy. I'm Ashley Lieberman, I'm a first-year grad student of occupational therapy. Evan Lane, and I'm the student director of the Spectre Center. He was forgot to introduce himself as the director. So, <laughs> <laughs> I lost my job. <laughs> Strategic Leadership, which began last January, and I'm a doctor coach in presentation and communications. And transparency, uh, Dr. Nash and I worked in 2004 together. I'm Wes Heinley. I'm a student within the College of Population Health at Thomas Jefferson University studying a Master's of Public Health degree. I'm Roxanne Ireland. I'm also a student at Thomas Jefferson University studying a Master's in Public what about you guys? <laughs> oh, I, I thought you were skipping me. Um, <laughs> yeah. but, um, this is Jane, um, law society program, so a student in Philadelphia University. I'm Ashley, I go to Philadelphia University. I'm a sophomore and I'm a psych major, but a long liner. Okay. Great. Do you want to queue up the topic, or you did that already? Yeah, you can. Okay, great. So, uh, Wow, uh, where do we even begin? <laughs> well, why don't I start with my Senator Specter story? That'll get everybody in a good mood. Uh, so, let's see, this is probably um, uh, at least 15 years ago uh, when I was mowing the lawn at my home in Lafayette Hill, 15 minutes from here, and uh, it was a hot uh, summer day, and uh, I'm in the middle of mowing the lawn, and the phone rings, my wife gets it, and the fellow on the other end of the phone says, this is your senator. And I says, oh, okay, you know, <coughs> phony phone call. Uh, and he says, I want to speak to Dr. Nash. Uh, apparently, he's the doctor on call. And to cut to the chase, uh, here's what happened. Um, so my wife comes out and she says, Senator Specter is on the phone and he wants to talk to you. I said, what? You know, can't you tell I'm busy? I'm mowing the lawn. <laughs> and so he would not take no for an answer. And uh, as you might remember, he was very public about his many health care challenges. He had survived uh, uh, coronary disease, uh, had uh, several different <coughs> types of cancer. So anyway, I was on call at that weekend, and he had called the service to say his shirt collar was tight and he was convinced that he had a brain tumor. Now, you don't know any medicine, but okay, that's sort of like a medical school student diagnosing like a rare disease using the wrong clue. But what turned out was he was exactly right. And so he called me and he said, I am absolutely convinced that I have a brain tumor. And I said, well, Senator, you know, what's going on? And he said, well, my collar is tight. And I said, well, this seems, you know, a little out of the ordinary. So anyway, 
cut to the chase, I made like 100 phone calls, we got him into Jefferson, and sure enough, he did in fact uh, have yet another cancer, which he survived eventually, but uh, I'll never forget my wife saying, he got this phony phone call, and uh, you know, interrupted my mowing the lawn. Anyway, great to be in a house that Thomas Jefferson visited too, so this is really spectacular. So, of course, what I was going to talk about, we could tear up that script uh, after the national election, of course, yesterday. And uh, I don't know what your politics are, but our family is in mourning at the moment. Uh, I have uh, three millennial children, uh, twin 29-year-old daughters and a 25-year-old son. I've had to uh, calm them all down. I'm not sure I've done a good job. Uh, one of my twin daughters is uh, married and lives in Washington, D.C. and works for the federal government in health care, so she's in a particularly interesting spot. But I think the broader question is, where is the country going to go from here with regard to delivering health care? So let's just set up a couple of big issues and maybe use our city as an example of some of the challenges. So this is a very smart group of young people. You appreciate that uh, one of Obama's signature accomplishments, passing health reform, what have we really achieved since March of 2010? And I think the most important message about that is um, providing greater access for probably more than 20 million Americans who have had no health insurance. And this is important because we are the only country in the Western world in the developed world where there is not universal coverage and universal access. So we're very, very lucky to some extent that six years of work has enabled us to say that we've been able to offer insurance to 20 million additional citizens. So I think that's one major take home. Uh, second take home is uh, this has set into motion some amazing even local changes in the entire healthcare marketplace. So I'd like to park that issue, we'll come back to it, because it's got an important Philadelphia component to it. So one message is covering 20 million citizens. Second message is really changing the structure of how care is delivered in our country, unleashing market forces that the bill is principally responsible for. So what are the challenges even before we get to President-elect Trump, which is even sort of <laughs> hard to even articulate, but okay. Uh, so what are some of the challenges that the country faces and then focus on Philadelphia very quickly? So our country spends um, roughly 18% of the GDP on health care. Uh, the closest Western nation does about 9, 10% maybe. Uh, Medicare spending alone is more than $1.2 billion every day for just Part A and Part B alone. Here's something great for Thanksgiving you could tell at the dinner. If Medicare were to secede from the union, very unlikely, but it would be the 10th largest GDP in the world. So there is no organization close to what Medicare is about anywhere on the planet. It's the number one expense, of course, of the federal government. So for the $3 trillion almost that we spend on health care, about half of it is probably wasteful. And this is significant, too, because of where we live. More on that in a minute. So for all that spending, here's the punchline. Based on the best available data from the National Academy of Medicine in a project not even three years ago, for all that spending, 18% of the GDP, what do we get for it? Well, as best as we could tell, according to irrefutable sources, we rank number 17 in the world with regard to the ability to do our job, health, wellness, every self-reported measure of happiness and healthiness, we are number 17. So here's the challenge. We spend the most and we're ranked number 17 in the world. So our work <coughs> at our College of Population Health is in part focused on how do we reconcile this, this unbelievable spending and wasteful aspects of it, and then on the other side, what does it get us? So what's the value, if you would, 
of what we get for the money we spend. That's the big sort of national challenge. Let's focus on our town, and then we'll try to set up the questions for where we're going in the new administration. So what about Philadelphia? So here's a city with five academic medical centers, one of which you're soon to be a part of, and we're hopefully by April of next year, we'll be one big happy family, so we ought to mention that. So in this town of five academic centers, if you took Drexel University College of Medicine and Sydney Kimmel Medical College and you put them together, that's 5% of America's physician workforce in training. No other city in the nation comes close. We're a city with three NCI-designated National Cancer Research Centers, multiple cardiac transplant centers, multiple level one trauma centers. We have probably 30% more hospital beds than we need based on utilization from other states. That's one part of the problem. Another part of the problem is what we call the social determinants of healthcare. Let me quickly describe those for you. So we love our town. We're a very important part of our nation's history uh, after all. So if you were to look at the nation's top 10 cities by population, we're either five or six, depending on whether Houston or Phoenix are doing the counting. But if you look at the top 10 cities by population in terms of average annual household income, we're the poorest. We're number 10 out of 10. So despite the fact that we're number five or six in population, in terms of wealth, we're the poorest. One out of four adults in this town still smoke cigarettes. National average 13, 14%. In a city with five academic medical centers, three NCI research centers. About 30 to 40% of all the public school students in K through 12 in Philadelphia County proper, more than a third of them are obese. What are we going to do with a 250-pound 12-year-old when she becomes an adult? From a clinical perspective, that's a disaster. And then finally, finally, because we're the poorest of the nation's top 10 cities, what does that mean? Well, it means that we have unbelievable income disparity, which drives lifespan. So to conclude on this, if you live in Society Hill, the zip codes around the towers in Society Hill versus North Philadelphia, less than a five mile difference, you have a 10 year difference in average annual lifespan, a 10 year difference in mortality. So we have one of the greatest income disparities, one of the greatest disparities in average lifespan, and the other social determinants that drive health of a population. So let's say, as a country, we're in a jam. We spend more than anybody else on the planet, and that gets us number 17 in the world. The Affordable Care Act is one important but tiny step in the right direction to try to tackle some of these issues. And now we're faced with a new administration who will be in power in a month and a half, whose avowed goal is to take this bill apart piece by piece as rapidly as possible. So we're in an incredibly important inflection point in where healthcare in the country and healthcare in our city is going to go. So the timing for tonight little did we know, couldn't have been more propitious to talk about what will be very shortly a front page issue every day as soon as uh, inauguration is complete. So I'm excited to be here to talk about this and I think we can tackle it on any number of levels, sort of nationally, where are we going? What will it mean for Philadelphia? And then what will it mean even for the family, Jefferson and Philadelphia University, moving forward, because it will have an impact on what we're going to look like, uh, you know, by spring of uh, 2017. So let me stop there, and first, any questions on anything that I had an opportunity to talk about, and then we'll kind of go around the room. I want to focus on national picture and the Philadelphia picture, but let's start with any questions. Uh, I used some vocabulary you might not be familiar with, but I think 
tried to summarize what the broader issues are. Any questions? I have a lot of questions, but for <laughs> the students first, does anyone have any questions first before I start taking them? <coughs> Within that 18% of the GDP spending that's on health care, you mentioned uh, Medicare being a big portion of big that. Portion. Does that happen to be the, the biggest piece of that pie? Well, that's a great question. So if you look at total health care spending, here's how I would picture it. Total health care spending, Medicare is about half of total health care spending. Right. So it's probably, you know, do the arithmetic. Um, the other piece, it's a great question that's unique to our country, about 40 cents of every dollar. So let's look at a dollar, 50 cents of spending is Medicare, hospital and doctor and drugs. The other, another 40 cents is spending by individual employer organizations to pay for health care for their employees. That's also unique to America. Um, there's no other country where health insurance and health care spending is tied to where you work. So great question. So roughly 50 cents Medicare, 40 cents employer, and then it's a mixture of the veterans and military and other folks who spend money on health care. Great question. If we spend far more than everybody else, as we I don't understand why we rank so low well in care. I think right. to real all the prenatal care right. is very low. Our, our uh, birth rates are not as high as it should be. So I think you have to understand the full ramifications. Our medical care is lower than a lot of countries that we wouldn't even picture. Well, I would be careful. I would say the outcomes of the care. care the outcome, right. So the question is, we're spending so much money. Why are we getting such poor outcomes? Yeah, so, wow, that's a really important question and something, uh, without exaggerating, that I've spent uh, 25 years working on. Uh, so, uh, Mike Dreyer knows that when I got to Jefferson in 1990, I was six foot two. Uh, so, you can't tell sitting in this chair, but I see eye to eye with Dean Dreyer. We're so. six, we're six four. <laughs> no, that's when I came here. <laughs> One of the reasons I, I like coming to Phil Reeves so much, uh, but in all seriousness, it's obviously a really important question. Let me let me see if I can try to chop this up. So, um, yes, despite all that spending, what accounts for the fact that we're number 17 in the world? So here's part of the jam. Um, we're practicing what has come to be called downstream medicine, which is it's not about health and wellness and prevention. It's all about tertiary and quaternary care, most especially in this town. Let me give you some examples. So instead of tackling school lunches and teaching nutrition and exercise and all of the aspects of prevention, we build bariatric surgery centers in the city which are very economically successful. Instead of promoting more parks and more bike riding and safer neighborhoods in which to exercise, we build more cardiac servicing centers and more cath labs and do more surgery than many other cities in the country. Instead of having classes on how to improve birth outcomes, uh, we have unbelievable technology devoted to top-level neonatal intensive care units where we routinely at CHOP and elsewhere save 23 and 24 uh, week old babies. So the challenge is um, overuse of technology, practicing what's come to be called downstream medicine rather than figuring out how do we shut the faucet off rather than mopping up the floor? How do we pay for prevention, wellness, keeping people healthy, rather than knuckle-headed trying to correct all the issues, but it goes across ages, across ethnic groups, and across every zip code in our county. Um, another way to look at this is uh, if you take publicly available data, so uh, years of education, average annual income, percentage of the county that uh, owns a car, uh, who, uh, private school enrollment, uh, smoking, 
Uh, if you take this, what's called now the county health ranking technology, readily available, and you overlay it on the state of Pennsylvania, which is on everybody's mind since yesterday, we have 67 counties in the Commonwealth, and we could rank the health and well-being of every county from 1 to 67. So let me ask the group, where do you think Philadelphia County ranks? And your choices are from 1 to 67, 1 being healthiest, happiest, best self-reported measures to do our jobs, go to work, feel happy about where we are, and 67 being worst health, worst outcomes. So where is Philadelphia County, home of Philly U, home of Jefferson, and four other medical schools? Would anybody venture a guess? Please. Oh, I was thinking probably closer to the bottom. We are, in fact, 67. So uh, we're last. And so another part of what our challenge is and what our college is about and um, what population health is about, I think that sort of tells the whole story. So population health and health reform is how do we reconcile this? The fact that this county with all of these resources, with all of the training, with all of the spending, we're ranked dead last right here at home in the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania. So it's a long-winded answer to your great question. I'm not going to get into all the clinical issues for the folks who are training in healthcare. Great to have Dean Dreyer here too, of course. Um, they know that, unfortunately, the evidentiary basis of what we do, in other words, um, the actual evidence to support what we do at the bedside, whether we're OT, PT, pharmacy, nursing, doctor, doesn't matter, we have pretty good evidence for basically one out of every five decisions. Let me let that hang in the air for a moment. Yeah, we have really good evidence about what we ought to be doing about 20% of the time. Which means 80% of the time we don't know what we're doing. <laughs> Regrettably, Regrettably, glad you said it. <laughs> regrettably, question. that's correct. Right. So, I mean, great question to start the conversation. It's hard to see behind it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Sadly, this is more of a comment than a question. And then, I think that's really more than stop commenting if I keep persisting in this one trick pony and horse thing. But if we're going to do an economic analysis of this issue, Philadelphia is one of the, you know, ranking 67th. That's the residents of Philadelphia, one of the poorest cities in the, you know, the top population cities in the country. And then we have all these very expensive facilities. Um, well, first of all, we, we have some very wealthy suburbs around the city, and I think many of the suburban residents are the ones using those facilities. They come into the city and take advantage of those high cost, technology intensive um, <coughs> uh, services. Not exclusively, obviously, but there, there they are. But my, my point, and I guess this can be twisted into a question, is <laughs> um, usually uh, the argument against public health, a public health service, is its inefficiency. Right, it's inefficiencies. The assumption in the United States is that pri private facilities will operate more efficiently because of they'll be interested in containing costs. But I would argue that in many ways it's exactly the opposite. I mean, the, the types of expensive facilities that Dr. Nash has been talking about, their purpose is to make money. You said they were enormously profitable, very successful economically. Um, so their purpose is to make money. A public health facility, one would hope, right? Their goal, they're spending the public money, they have a budget, would be actually to work more efficiently, to want to do the kind of preventive care you were talking about so that these expensive um, medical treatments, interventions, are not necessary in the future, that that would save the larger system money. But when the goal is to make money from these expensive facilities, where is the motivation to stop encouraging their use? 
Well, so this is a really complicated. Um, <laughs> let, let's see if we could uh, kind of draw it back to the topic at hand. So um, you might be surprised to learn that the um, income from operations of Jefferson University Hospital, the margin from operations is 1%. <laughs> So if it weren't for philanthropy, we would have to close the door to the university hospital. So it's really not accurate to say it's all about making money. Uh, it, it, we could do all kinds of things. If making money were the key goal, we, we wouldn't give $80 million a year of uncompensated care. I mean, it's a far more complicated than that. I think the challenge in a town like ours also, given that we are training the OTPT pharmacy and doctor of the future, well, that's an inherently very inefficient process. And that's another part of increasing cost, probably a topic for another time. Uh, but I, I think the, let's see if we could tie that back to the Affordable Care Act, because that's after all the topic, and then what might happen, you know, six weeks from now, which we never could have anticipated prior to tonight. So I think one of the benefits of the ACA in the six years of implementation, and remember, we're not done. Uh, there's components of the bill that don't take effect until 2019, 2020. So this, this very complex social change bill is not even completely implemented yet. But one of the things that the bill has unleashed to tackle the challenge that was just articulated is to begin to change the payment system so that hospitals and doctors will start to say, you know, it's more cost effective for us to practice prevention than it is for us to have what we call heads in the beds. Um, this is a very complex industry and we're trying to, the analogy I like to think about is we're turning the battleship around inside the Panama Canal. You know, it's very tight fit, <laughs> awfully hard to visualize. But what we're really saying is, especially via Medicare, which is the focus of the Affordable Care Act, and most private insurance companies follow the lead of Medicare. So here's the punchline. If I could pay the system to keep people out of the hospital, that's a large part where this bill is pushing the delivery system to go. It's hard to get your arms around that since we've been in business, most especially in the, le in the last 30 years with the greatest growth of the industry, to deliver service, to do the physical therapy, order the drug, do the surgery, whatever it is. We get rewarded for more that we do. Now we're being rewarded via the Affordable Care Act to actually think twice about delivering that service and concentrate more on, that we said before, upstream medicine, keeping people out of the hospital and focusing on prevention and wellness, which is not sexy. It's not a cool procedure. There's no special building. There's no temple of technology devoted to prevention and wellness. We have lots of temples of technology downtown across all five academic centers devoted to all kinds of technology and all kinds of procedures. So the Affordable Care Act has unleashed amazing market forces to get back to the question. And the, I think where we're going under a new administration is, can those market forces, will they be reversed? And can they be reversed at this point? And if we were to reverse them, what would that mean for the country? So I think, let, let's start with Dean Dreyer, who, you know, expert on aspects of this. Let's frame it up this way. If we were to tr attempt to take apart this bill piece by piece, what might some of the implications be? And uh, I think that's a fair starting point, something we never could have anticipated for tonight. I was all prepared to talk about how exciting the future looks and how much progress we've made in six years. So I think, Mike, maybe you could start with, if we were to attempt to take this bill apart as President-elect has said he wants to do, what might be some of the implications? And we could talk about it both nationally and locally. So why don't you start? Well, that's the biggest 
you know, I think the biggest question is that, you know, the, 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 the push on, on pushback on the, on the Affordable Care, on Obamacare, is that, you know, we want a market-driven system, right? right? We want a market-driven system. And so there are 20 million new people who are now in the system. The biggest component of that has been the expansion of Medicaid, right? Right? People who don't have money, <laughs> right? Right? They're the medically indigent who have found their way into the system. We moved from the indigent to the medically indigent. We're getting some of the working poor um, are now getting health care. So the pushback has been we need to have a market driven system. How you create a market driven system for people who can't afford the market right, is, I think, an insurmountable question. Mike, can you just define the market-driven system as using a term? <laughs> Tell us what it is. A, a market-driven system is where you have the, the people who are, uh, you, have, you have services that are provided by hospitals and health insurance and uh, pharmaceutical companies, and the price of that service is driven by demand. Yeah, I would say an easy done. definition, I'll interrupt. Uh, where the forces of supply and demand work. And so healthcare has been an industry where those forces historically have never worked. And there's classic papers going back to the 1960s that outline that healthcare is impervious to typical market forces, in part because the buyer doesn't have typical market knowledge. So one real challenge, as Mike articulated, is uh, you can't bring market forces to healthcare, most especially for the poor. Even for people who are wealthy and well informed, the notion that uh, supply and demand work in the appropriate directions in healthcare, that's never been the case. In fact, we have so much what's called induced demand for healthcare that's advertising, and in this town in particular, an unbelievable amount of health related advertising that stimulates demand. So market forces in healthcare have never really worked. And that's going to be, I think that's where there's going to be a challenge because I think under the new administration there's been a lot of, um, you know, a lot of promises made. Right. Uh, and the, the, the push, the, the response has been, well, we're not just going to take it away, we're going to replace it. But right. there's never been a picture of what you replace it with. Right. So and I there's a reason for that. Because so this is a great take home. So let's make a list, I think, this would be important as we try to, you know, later make a summary. So if we were if the president elect were to, let's just say, reduce Medicaid uh, allocation and give states complete control, because that's his goal. So most of the Republican states, which have not expanded Medicaid on average, will just continue to say, no, the poor will not have increased access. That it would be a gigantic setback. And to get to Mike's other point, a good portion of those 20 million, yes, Medicaid and another big piece on the exchanges, it's very likely that the exchanges will be dismantled and will go away. So for young people in this room who will have to buy insurance at least under the current rules by the time they're 26, there may not be an exchange to go to. And certainly there won't be any subsidies as there are today for young people who may have low income to participate in the exchange. So we've got three hits, a Medicaid hit, an expenditure hit, and a subsidy hit. Well, that, that's a lot to contend with. Three strikes, you're out. And so we're going to have a lot of uninsured people. What does that mean in Philadelphia? Well, they'll end up in the Jefferson Emergency Room, <laughs> costing four times as much as if they, if they had access to preventive care. So we've got this vicious cycle, which is why you want to tear your hair out, uh, trying to understand how complex this is. Well, you had your hand yeah, up, too. Um, so I was working in geriatric home health before I came to Geriatric back. home health. Before I came Great. to academia, under Medicare and Medicaid. A and B, I cringe on the inside looking at everything because I know. Right. Um, but one thing that I noticed was that my company was very big on preventative care before it was sort of a sexy thing to talk Great. about. But what we received a lot of pushback was 
a lack of awareness of role of the allied health in preventative medicine. Sure. Um, a recent study showed occupational therapy is um, the only health profession that keeps people out of the hospital, which right. made us really excited. Um, but what we would find is that people would call us ambulance chasers. They would accuse us of that because we're so reactive in our approach to help. We wait for someone to fall right. and cost our system thousands and thousands of dollars rather than go in and just do a home assessment and make it safe. Great. So I feel like that's something as a society we're also going to have to fight that idea of no preventative medicine is okay. Right. And it's actually what we should be doing versus okay. no one's chasing the ambulance. We're not trying to put you into the system for money. Great. So here's a good, well, that's a fantastic example. So let, let me take your great point and we'll even extend it a little bit. So if you were running a even a for-profit insurance company, you would want to have you and your colleagues make a home visit today to prevent that fall where you then have to pay for the hip replacement uh, later. Let me give you a real example. So my uh, late mother, God bless her, uh, she was in a for-profit managed care plan in Florida and they sent a nurse practitioner, among other people, to her home to get the shag rug out of her bathroom. Now, why would they do that? Well, they did that so she wouldn't fall and break her hip because they have to pay the bill. So now we have to find a way to continue to promote that kind of upstream thinking, great example that you gave too, to practice prevention, get those bars in the shower, make sure they doesn't slip on the rug, do that for you know thousands of enrollees. Early and screening for falls. Drugs. Exactly. Then we can reduce expenditure on hip replacement. But uh-oh, got to be careful because at the moment, those hip replacements are a very important part of the engine of the 18% of the GDP that is healthcare. So again, we're in this inflection point. But if we don't promote that kind of thinking, we're going to be in a big jam. So let's add that to the list of worry. So uh, Dean Dreyer started with cutting Medicaid. That's a huge problem. Uh, you've brought up lack of focus on prevention. And it's only going to cost us more down the road. We know roughly that every dollar spent on prevention getting that rug out is about a $3.50 to $4 return. But making that work in this quarter is very important. But down the road, it's about a three to three and a half dollar to four dollar return for every dollar we spend on prevention. What we also find is when we know that you know maybe we did get a, a referral for a home assessment, we're so excited because we'll actually be able to prevent something. There you go. The documentation requirement in huge. order to get it approved no, right. is so much more stringent than if something sure. had happened. And if you're yeah. not a airtight documenter, Great. it falls on the company. All right, so that's another great point uh, that we are faced, uh, which is um, the amount of information necessary to drive good decision making and to get paid. Well, that's given birth to an entire health information technology industry. I mean, a very important uh, health, uh, IT, an important major on this campus, right? So a huge industry uh, that uh, Jefferson is uh, paying some gigantic bills to try to implement tools that will help to digitize all this and give us an electronic medical record, instant access to some of this information, uh, adding more cost and more complexity. We have various really important threats that I just want to pull together. So I don't feel there's so much, there's so much, so much going on. Speak. Okay, so the first thing which you made very clear is we've got a backwards medical system. Correct. Mop Upside down. We'll mop up to make sure there's no Doesn't that stuff. work? I mean, you really have that visual view. We're mopping up the floor and the yeah. faucet is just on full force. And we're trying so hard. ACA got the faucet half off, maybe a quarter closed. And now all of a sudden we're going to open it back up. So these are, these are the threats. Yeah. The first thing is how did we get there? That's the first thing. Yeah, that's the second thing is that you mentioned all throughout the ACA to be turning back. back. Yes. And the other part I think was mentioned was is the cost for young people. Because you talked about the subsidies. But I think we have to make it very clear what that means in the everyday Great. world. So Great. if you could go sure. and address those. Sure. Let, well, let's maybe tackle it in, in reverse order from what you said. So 
the subsidies. Um, Uncle Sam, via the ACA, never really appreciated just how much the exchanges were going to cost. So while the Affordable Care Act promoted the creation of this public exchange where you could, it's like a separate marketplace to buy insurance at a lower rate, the for-profit insurance companies suffered hundreds of millions of dollars of losses, which Uncle Sam promised he would pay back and never did. So the insurance companies, you could argue, you know, uh, you know, it's like the owner Helmsley, say what you will, she runs a hell of a hotel, you know. Uh, yes, they lost hundreds of millions, and they want to withdraw from the exchanges. I think had Mrs. Clinton won, we'd be having a constructive conversation about how to prop up the exchanges, get more people covered, and make that process work. I think what we're going to see, unfortunately, is probably the dismantling of the entire apparatus, throwing people back out into the uninsured. So that's uh, going to be a big problem. And that's something that is likely to occur in the new administration. The other piece, back to your list, uh, at least uh, in the email that I've seen in the last uh, 24 hours, and the the persons who will probably be in a leadership role in healthcare, they uh, don't believe in Medicaid expansion. Quite frankly, they're all about Medicaid retrenchment, forcing people, up, by example, to uh, demonstrate that they're working towards getting a job or capping the average annual income. We're going to see some very difficult social determinants of health issues if Medicaid is cut on individual states and giving individual governors the power to radically reduce Medicaid subsidies that's going to be a gigantic challenge. Let's connect another dot that we were talking about prenatal care a little while ago. At this moment Medicaid pays for 50% of all births in the United States. Not a well-known fact. So if we're going to cut Medicaid, we're going to have a decrease in prenatal care. That's going to lead to more problems in that time period. Sicker babies, smaller babies, more babies at risk, and off we go again. Then we'll need a more technologic fix, and now we're back into that vicious cycle. So, here's the money is not there. The money is well. Then um, are we are we making a decision to sacrifice? Well, I think we're not talking about money. Right. I, I think more important than the money because we demand for healthcare is unlimited. That's one of the other challenges in our culture. But what our college is trying to elucidate is. Could we change the way we get paid to focus more on that prevention, wellness, nutrition, <coughs> exercise, uh, designing in health in all we do? So this is a great opportunity for our two great universities to come together and use all the graduate training in all the health professions and design and architecture to say, if we build healthier cities, if we pay attention to health in all we do, will that contribute to wellness? And the answer there is yes, probably in a much more cost-effective way than we're currently doing. So maybe there's some hope with that thread, which we haven't really touched on. But getting back to the new administration, I mean, no one knows today exactly which aspects could be immediately by executive order reverse, but giving more rights to the governors by reducing subsidies, by, you know, quote, propping people up so they could, you know, be more on their own to make decisions. I mean, based on all what we've learned since 2010, this is going to be a very difficult process. Very difficult question. Yes, please. So not so much a question, it's more of a comment. So I'm willing to bet that the 16 countries that are ranked higher, most of which are socialized systems, right. 
right? And just in that fact alone, there is no profit to be made in a socialized system. Whereas in our system, we have a capitalist system. Yes, the margins are very low, but insurance companies is money. Insurance companies declared $50 billion in gains last year. So they're making money. They just want to come out of the exchanges because those specific little insurance plans are losing money. But in overall, they're making a lot of money. And in our system, our system doesn't pay to be a preventative system. So keeping people out of a hospital, although it's great for the populace, for the population, it's bad for business. And yes, there's a 1% margin, but we keep it at a 1% margin because we're not for profit. Let's just yeah. be very honest with that, right? So, but it, we are making money. We are making money in hospital system, otherwise we close it down. I mean, we're not bleeding money. We're just not making as much money as we want. We divert some of those, the, those funds somewhere else. Um, so our system is not set up or designed to be a preventative system. For a reason, because we have a capitalist system. In those socialist systems, absolutely. In some countries in Europe, they actually want you to go to the gym and work out three days a week, and you're paid to go to the gym and work out three, four, five days a week. The government pays you to do that because they know it's healthier in the long run, and they know it's going to save money in the long run, and the government's not having to pay money out. But in our system, right, we want our people to go to the hospital. We want them to be sick, and that's what we want them to be. But from a capitalist system, it makes sense. Yeah. Right. So let's bring it back to tonight's conversation. So clearly, o Obama, one of the aspects of Obamacare is to um, promote patient engagement in their own care and to have patients have skin in the game in the economic decision making. So what does that mean? That means that we have created economic incentives to promote prevention and wellness. One way we do that is if you're a smoker, your premiums are much higher. If you're uh, severely overweight, your premiums are much higher. If you go to the gym, we'll give you a bonus. We'll, we'll cut your co-payment. Uh, in certain plans, we'll give you appropriate drugs for free because we know how effective they are. Well, President-elect Trump wants to do away with those incentives. Well, now we're going to go back again to where we were seven, eight, a decade ago and face all of those economic challenges all over again. So um, taking apart this bill is going to be fraught with social challenges, challenges about equity, challenges about where is the appropriate moral authority in our country. How do we view health care? Is it a right of every citizen or only something that folks who are lucky enough to have insurance? Um, if we dismantle even the Medicaid subsidies, we're going to put tens of millions of, of citizens at risk again of uh, bankrupting themselves to pay their medical bills. The number one cause of personal bankruptcy in the United States is inability to pay your medical bill. No other country does that. Let's focus for a minute on the social spending. This is actually a really important area. Um, so yes, uh, countries like France, Germany, Australia, all the Scandinavian nations, um, all spend less and rank higher than the United States. Well, those are, I wouldn't describe them as pure socialist economies. Uh, they are very competitive at the global scale. I think the real issue is what do we mean by social spending versus medical spending? It is true that in the Western nations, they have greater social spending than us on a per capita basis, far greater. That's um, medical leave for both men and women for childbirth. That's um, three-year-olds going to full-day kindergarten. That is uh, making child care workers more appropriately paid for. So and now, new administration, I mean, I don't know for sure, but I think you could probably place a bet that social spending typically is not a top Republican agenda item. So, once again, if we reduce 
the low level of social spending we already have, which will increase income disparity, which will be a social determinant of poor health, we're going to go even further back in time to increase health care costs. So I think tying these dots together is really pretty important. Is a question? Yes, please. Yeah, actually, yes, when I come to, um, okay, I'll be the Nichols and tell the word that you can't hold the truth tonight. Now, I'm from China, which to many American minds, a socialist country, which is not really entirely at this present day. How the healthcare system works in China and in Commonwealth nations is a universal healthcare, but in China it's not really likewise. However, let's not get to that point. The motivation of the American capitalistic society demands that basically ideology that people tend to go where the money flows. So in the current set of situation where you perform a surgery on a patient can earn you more than just prescribe some medicine, which is a fact that we're facing and that is a conception that's really hard to reach, really hard to change, and that is the current situation. Where in this country you can buy a cheeseburger from McDonald's for two fifty um, for two dollar fifty, or a salad from some salad bar for four times the price, right? I remember this time I I used to live around Washington D.C. This time I went to see a friend uh, who's in um, politics, and uh, on the way to school I was calling him. I said, you know what, man, I'm really hungry. I need to get some food. I can't even talk to you in a reasonable way because I was hungry. And usually we talk topic, uh, we, we speak about political topic all the time, and uh, all these um, big DC talk. And I was really hungry, and I, so I got a, I, I got a hot dog for a dollar from uh, from the stand on the street, and I suddenly started, okay, let's talk about Shakespeare or Victor Hugo, which one's a better, a better writer. But it's basically the moral of the story is if you cannot meet the most basic demand of one's physical demand, you, how do you inspire them to change this already existing misconception about how to save money? If you eat healthier, exercise, do more preventive, you don't have to end up paying the surgery. The truth is, it's to my opinion, um, just to bring this up as a side topic, that um, my high school dissertation on politics, I uh, do, did a PPT says how Obamacare can bring this country to another financial crisis like 2008. Mm -hmm. That's my dissertation and I still believe that to this day because it's not going to work. This capitalist society does not fit in that category where social spending meant to go to the public. However, the social spending, uh, spending the resource of that generates from the public who are not willing, people, willing to pay for tax dollars. Especially with the Republican in charge. Uh, back in 2012, many people were holding their position with Romney or Obama. Uh, that ended up voting with Obama, saying because Obama is just going to do the very same on tax. And Mitt Romney is promising less tax and more social spending, which many people did not buy that ideology. And we had Obama for another four years. And so, with this format, in a capitalist format, the purest capitalist format on this planet, the United States of America, how do we have this sort of universal health care or even a government assisted or base health care system to benefit the people? And with the poor and rich gap, that seems rather uh, utopian. Well, wow. I'm not sure I know what your question is, but <laughs> <laughs> I was listening carefully. Um, so let me pick up on one thing you did say, which is really interesting, we haven't talked about. Uh, so if you look at um, individual behavior, let's really forget politics for a minute. If we just looked at individual behavior and its contribution to health and wellness, here's, here's a, a, a quiz. So if you took all adult Americans, anybody over 18, every race, all ethnicities, any state, what percentage of all adults do these five things? And you got to do all five things. You don't get partial credit. Um, uh, exercise, let's just say regular, 20 minutes, three times a week. Uh, don't smoke cigars or cigarettes. Um, wear a seat belt. Uh, eat their fruits and vegetables like their mother taught them. And are 
at an appropriate body mass index. So let me give it to you one more time. Uh, eight, uh, eight, eat their fruits and vegetables, don't smoke, an appropriate body mass index, wear a seatbelt, and uh, exercise regularly. You gotta do all five things. What percentage of the entire U.S. population of adults only do currently all five of those things? Zero. 20%. So we have 10%, 20%, 5%, zero. <laughs> zero is that zero. So the answer is 3%. So to your point, so 3% is a pretty small number. Um, so part of our culture in the <coughs> capitalist society has been, well, uh, here's the analogy I would make. And this is a tough behavioral economic question that we're going to need to work on in the future, no matter what happens under Trump. Um, here's the cultural equivalent of what I'm talking about. So uh, let's use McDonald's since he brought that up. So on the way to McDonald's, I'm going to take my lipid lowering medication <laughs> that Uncle Sam is going to pay for. And when I get to McDonald's, I'll be happy to buy the cheeseburger of choice. And that is kind of tightly woven into what I would describe as uh, just American culture. It's still sort of uh, individualism, autonomy, individual decision making, a lack of government interference. Um, so this is a cultural challenge, this 3% number. And this has a great impact on utilization of healthcare, healthcare spending. Let me put it another way, since we're at two great universities, another way to tie sort of Affordable Care Act and culture and education. So for OT, PT, nurses, midwives, pharmacists, physicians, all of us in both universities now, how much of our curriculum is devoted to counseling, behavioral economics, understanding nutrition, exercise physiology, addiction management, all of the behavioral issues that drive so much of behavior that leads to healthcare spending. So I think a great fertile area for the future when we come together is thinking through the curriculum of the MPH of the future, the OT, the MD, the PharmD, the midwife, what will she, how will she be trained to deal with this 3% of the population doing these appropriate behaviors. It's a gigantic cultural challenge. We have a, a term called occupational justice and occupational balance in OT. Great term. The access to activities that you need and want to do. Great term. But I think about society and what we're doing to ourselves with workaholism yeah. and how to survive in a capitalist society we have to work all the time. Yeah. And how does that promote that imbalance and therefore you don't have the time mm -hmm. to exercise or you belong to a slower socioeconomic group and you don't have access to right. a safe park to go for the that, walk. Absolutely. How that all ties into us as a society. And that gets us back things. to the design issue, right? And absolutely. health and all we do and including design. I think you just right. read a really great article the other day on how access to public transportation directly correlates to health absolutely. in population. Right, right. Really fantastic. Yeah. Please. Um, at the basis of everything you've talked about tonight, you've given us some wonderful information. I'm so struck by the public discourse around the same topic right. that it's oversimplified, totally underdeveloped, and we do not have a public discourse based Great point. on many of the facts that you just said because it's easier to oversimplify death panels. Right. It's easy to oversimplify. Moonshot. Yes. Right. Than to actually talk about the subject in any data driven Great. understanding of it. Great. How do we combat yeah. that with this young group who is now going out yeah. and we hope has an impact Boy. on that public discourse? Well, spoken from a communication expert. Great <laughs> point. And uh, really a take home message that we should add to the list of things. So, the campaign was characterized by dreadful public discourse, totally.
selfishly, I like to think healthcare is uh, more complicated than the others and definitely does not lend itself to a 10 second sound bite. Let me give you a great example of exactly what you brought up. So when Vice President Biden came to Philadelphia uh, a number of months ago, and he foolishly went to the University of Pennsylvania. <laughs> <laughs> we'll forgive him for that. So, as everybody here knows, that was part of the launch of the moonshot to beat cancer, right? Well, I did an NPR radio interview, and I regrettably, I said, well, it was the silliest thing I'd ever heard. And what I meant to say was maybe the vice president ought to have come to Philadelphia to declare a war on childhood obesity and smoking because if we were to declare a war on smoking we would have a greater impact on cancer mortality than he could ever hope to achieve by declaring the moonshot to cure cancer. But similarly that got instant press coverage, everybody can get their head around, oh, I get it. If we all focus and we can then, with enough resources, we'll be able to, you know, cure cancer with this moonshot. It's easy to come up with these kinds of snappy, communication-related press sound bites that obscure the lack of the dialogue and just how complex the social determinants are. You know, to tie together the two comments about our society, if you said to me, well, what's the single greatest contributing factor to why we're number 17? I would give you my view, and that's actually pretty straightforward. And that is income disparity. And in our great country, in the 21st century, we have the greatest income disparity of any other country in world history. That's not sustainable. And what really troubles me is in a new administration that does not believe publicly in expanding subsidies, that's going to worsen income disparity and in my worldview drive worse health, more inappropriate spending, probably pushing us down further on that list. So at the end of the day, it's an awful lot about where you live as a proxy, your zip code as a proxy for income, is the single most important determinant of your health. Well, that's a sad fact. I think we have one more question. We have time for one more, one um, more question. Please. My question was, so now we're kind of in this limbo between our president and our president-elect. Yes. And my question is, what do we do now? How do we, if we want to involve ourselves, how Great. do we advocate? What do we do? How, who do we reach out to? I know Great. I've, you know, thought about already contacting representatives just to voice my opinion, but Great. I would like to know, is there more? Boy, what a great question to end on, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's fantastic. I mean, and uh, that's one call to action. So, uh, you know, I think it is a, a call to action. And I hope, uh, look, it's too late for my generation, so <laughs> it's up to you guys <laughs> and gals. I, I think there's a couple of really important concrete things. So one is what we're doing right here tonight is incredibly valuable, which is having discourse with real good information and listening to one another in a polite, appropriate fashion. So kudos to the Spectre Center and having a forum like this, that's fantastic. So that's step one is education, for sure. I think step two is uh, let's see some more political activism, which is working at the community level, working with your state elected representatives, your congressperson. Nothing can be done, well only pieces of the bill can be taken apart by executive order. The rest will have to go to a vote. And so engaging with your elected representatives now is certainly the time and getting to all of them pre-Christmas is probably a darn good yeah. idea uh, when they're going to go back home to their constituents to make sense out of what happened yesterday and the day before so I think some political activism so education that's the key second would be engagement and uh, appropriate political activism 
And then three would be what our two great universities are going to be all about. Let's change the curriculum to prepare a new type of leader for the future. And certainly Dean Dreyer and I and the provost, uh, we are all about already focusing now in anticipation of next spring to begin to create programs and curriculum that will build the kinds of leaders we're going to need. That's a little bit of a longer term strategy, but if we don't start now, you know, we won't be able to accomplish that. So what a fantastic concluding question. Great, great question. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Great to be together.